When, at midnight on August the 14th, 15th, 1945, Britain's Prime Minister came to the microphone to announce the surrender of Japan, the voice we heard was the voice not of Winston Churchill, but of Clement Attlee. Yesterday, the Japanese, the last of our enemies, whose ambitions plunged the world into so much bloodshed and misery, signed the terms of surrender in Tokyo. Without waiting for total victory, the British people had started a new political chapter in their island's history. From the war cabinet, Winston Churchill had turned to the hustings of a general election to conduct a lively and hard-hitting campaign. Socialism is in its essence an attack not only upon British enterprise, but upon the right of an ordinary man or woman to breathe freely without having a harsh, clumsy, tyrannical hand clapped across their mouths and nostrils. Socialist leader Clement Attlee, Churchill's right hand during the war, gave his answer from the left. We need a planned location of industry to give a balance to the country and to preserve social capital. We must have no more distressed areas. No one of these things can be effective without giving power to the government. The Prime Minister made much play last night with the rights of the individual and the danger of people being ordered about by officials. I entirely agree that people should have the greatest freedom compatible with the freedom of others. But there was a time when employers were free to work little children 16 hours a day. When the ballots were counted, a revolution, peaceful but profound, had been ushered in. Five months later, in Nuremberg, the leaders of another kind of revolution were arraigned before the bar of world justice to answer for their crimes against humanity. Hermann Goering was the first to plead not guilty. Before I die Frage des Gerichtshofes beantworte, ob ich mich schuldig oder nicht schuldig bekenne. You must plead guilty or not guilty. Ich bekenne mich im Sinne der Anklage nicht schuldig. Rudolf Hess. Nein. That will be entered as a plea of not guilty. For a year, the trial moved along its ponderous legalistic course. Then came the judgment. Defendant Hermann Wilhelm Goering, on the counts of the indictment on which you have been convicted, the International Military Tribunal sentences you to death by hanging. Defendant Rudolf Hess. And on through a list of names that once felt power and terror in Europe. Keitel. Rosenberg, Frank, Funk, Streicher. One name, the most hated of them all, was not on that list. A mild-looking schoolmaster, Heinrich Himmler, creator of the dreaded Gestapo, cheated justice with a file of cyanide. A British sergeant major saw him die. After a struggle, uh, lasting a quarter of an hour, in which we tried all methods of artificial respiration under the direction of the doctor, he died. And when he died, we threw a blanket over him and left him. While the free world was squaring its account with the war criminals at Nuremberg, Britain dealt with a traitor whose sardonic voice had taunted her when she stood alone. Germany calling. Germany calling. We are continuing our news in England. William Joyce, radio puppet of Propaganda Minister Goebbels, was brought back to a city that his Nazi masters had condemned to death. And with the final rejection of his appeal against the death sentence, Lord Haw-Haw's voice became a sordid memory. Germany calling, Germany calling, Germany calling. At last, Britain had answered. 